appreciate the blessing, the song taken straight out of Scripture, Numbers chapter 6, if you're wondering where that reference is, Numbers chapter 6. Aaron, it's called the priestly prayer, prays that over the nation of Israel. I just want to take a moment, and we would do the same. We stand with the nation of Israel. We stand with their right to exist as a nation. We believe in their right to speak for themselves and to defend themselves as a nation. Ever since they became a nation in 1948, every day, every day, there are those plotting to destroy their nation. So they, every day they wake up, they're mindful of that. And it doesn't mean we agree with every policy of the nation of Israel. We believe their land, they're inheriting the land and becoming a nation is fulfillment of prophecy in Scripture from thousands of years ago. So would you join me in just praying, not just for Israel, but for the Palestinian people, for that area. We're told to pray in Psalm 122. We're told pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So let's do that, church. So Father, this morning we come to you often praying for the Middle East. Sometimes not even knowing how to pray. It's so complicated. But Father, I pray, as Scripture tells us, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the righteousness of Jerusalem. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that Jews would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and their, as their Messiah. We pray for the Palestinian people that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God, I pray for the the area. We pray for the Gaza Strip. We pray for what's happening there, for those who've lost loved ones. I pray you would grieve, you would comfort those who grieve. You'd be present. You'd show up in powerful ways. We ask for your sovereignty to be accomplished in that area. We pray for the Palestinian people who are caught in between. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We, are, we have the privilege to be in Acts chapter 4 today as we look at the beginning of the early church. I'm grateful for Patrick who preached us through Acts chapter 3 last weekend, so thank you Patrick for that. We're in Acts chapter 4, and today we're going to look at the evidence that you've been with Jesus. If someone were to ask you or someone were to ask me, how, how do I know you've been with Jesus? Are there some marks of your life? Is there some evidence of your life that you've been with Jesus other than telling someone, yeah, I saw Jesus, I've met Jesus, I hung out with Jesus. If you weren't to tell someone that, what's the evidence of your life that you've been with Jesus? This passage, this text tells us three things that point to the fact that you and I have been with Jesus. Now we come to the end of chapter 3. And Peter and John are preaching. So they're preaching. We come to the verse 4, uh, chapter 1. Now, where are we? We're in Jerusalem. We're in the temple. This is where we left off. Last couple weeks, we looked at the crippled man who, for 40 years, he's been crippled. And then he was healed miraculously. And just a note on that. Uh, didn't share this a couple weeks ago, but Jesus walked by that man many times. How do we know that? Because he was at the door of the temple. Jesus walked through that door many, many times. He chose not to heal him. There are times Jesus chooses not to answer your prayer the way you want it to be answered. Jesus walked by him, did not heal him. Jesus did not heal everybody. He, he walked by people who needed healing. And I wonder if he thought when he walked by him, hey, your time's coming. Hang in there. Your time's coming. In a couple months, you're going to be healed. But God's providential time was so that you and I could be talking about him today. He waited. So here we are in Jerusalem. Peter and John, verse, verse 1 of chapter 4. If you need a Bible, we have some Bibles in the back. You're welcome to use those. Verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, who's they? Peter and John. Who's the people? You can tell us who the people are. The priests and the captain of the temple, so the, the police of the temple. The Sadducees came upon them. 
Now, he's going to list, now Luke's writing this as evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus defeated death. He's writing this, right? The whole book is evidence on who Jesus is. There's going to be 11 groups or people mentioned in opposition to these two men. Peter and John, two ordinary guys. Nothing special about them. Two ordinary guys. Versus up against 11 groups of power, 11 groups of tradition, 11 groups of hundreds of years of tradition and religion. It's what they're up against. If you were betting, who are you betting on here? There's three groups right there. And they were greatly annoyed. Now, why are they annoyed, the Sadducees? Sadducees are different than the Pharisees. They're wealthier. Sadducees were more aristocratic. A lot of wealth, a lot of power. The Pharisees believed in the miraculous. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. The Sadducees believed in the Torah, the word of God, literally, every word. But they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the the supernatural. So why are they annoyed? They're annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus, what? The resurrection from the dead. You want to tick off a Sadducee? Preach about the resurrection. Not just the resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection of, of people. Right? You and I, as followers of Jesus, death is not the end. Right? Our hope is not that we're, we're in this world. One day, death will face us all. I think recent research is 10 out of 10 of us are going to die. It's the current numbers. But... In Jesus, we don't suffer the full power and weight of death. Would you rather get hit by a bus or get hit by the shadow of a bus? Shadow of a bus. Followers of Jesus in the room, you will not get hit by the weight of the power of death. You get hit by the shadow of death, meaning you're here one second, the very next second you're in the presence of Jesus. That is the resurrection that gives us hope today. We have hope, not in this life. This life, there's a lot... Let's go have coffee. There's a lot of hopeless things in this world. But you are not hopeless. Your hope is in Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Endures forever. And because of that, we have hope. And we have victory over the grave. Oh, grave, where is your sting? Or death, where is your victory, Paul writes? We have victory in Jesus. So what are they preaching? They're preaching that. The Sadducees, they're not happy. It must be so sad to not believe in the resurrection and believe in the miraculous, right? That's why they're so sad, you see. (laughs) Some of you, you knew that was coming. Couldn't pass that up. And so what do they do? They grab them. They seize them. Shut them up. No more. They grab them. They lay hands on them. This is the first persecution recorded in scripture this is the first time somebody as a follower of jesus is having to count the cost up to this point we don't see this in scripture this is the first mention of physical persecution in scripture this begins 10 waves of persecution over the next 300 years 300 years of beheadings of the roman emperor nero impaling followers of Jesus, lighting them on fire so his garden could be lit at night. It goes on and on and on. Fox's Book of Martyrs, you want to read more about what that looked like, you can read about Fox's Book of Martyrs. The early church grew because of the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Now, we wouldn't ask for that. We don't want that. But the church grew. At this point in time, there's very few in numbers, followers of Jesus. They were inexperienced in leadership. They had never led any. The disciples had never led anything. They were commanded to not fight back. They were not militant. They weren't having protests. They were opposed by just about every institution that had existed for hundreds of years. Two ordinary guys just preaching about Jesus. They didn't have degrees. They didn't have religious upbringing and background. In fact, they're still at the temple. Another reason all the chief scribes and elders, they're so upset. Why? Because they're at the temple doing this. They weren't at their church building. 
there at the temple. Because to them, this is just continues on the fulfillment of the Jewish law. Jesus continues on in the fulfillment of the Jewish law. So why wouldn't they just go to the temple? Does this make sense? They're not going somewhere else because they don't know that this is something new. This is just, oh, Jesus is the Messiah. We're going to go to the temple to worship Jesus. So those who didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, they're like, what are you guys doing here? They're upset and they're annoyed. And so they arrest them. The first glimpse of the cost of not just thousands, but millions of followers of Jesus to this day. It's believed that in the last 10 years, there have been more martyrs for the Christian faith than existed 1,900 years, 2,000 years before. Really? Today? Yes. You and I, we, we have freedom of worship. We, we can publicly meet. We're not... We don't have fear today of being skinned alive or being crucified because of our, of our faith. This is the first sign. So they're, they're grabbed and they're arrested and put in custody until the next day for it was already evening. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about it was the time of prayer. It was late afternoon. But many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. 5,000 people believed, heard that and believed, gave their life to Jesus. Two guys, two ordinary people. How do you know that you've been in the presence of Jesus? I'm going to point number one, boldness and courage. Your identity in Jesus, there's, there's courage that comes out of that. When you know who you are in Jesus, there's a courage. You, listen, my friends, your, your identity is not found in your job or your lack of a job or your family background, or your lack, or your family name. Your identity is not found in your family name. Your identity is found in the name that Jesus gives you. Your identity is not found in your stuff, in your house, in where you live. Your identity is found in Jesus. And when you recognize that, do your best to me. You can't hurt me, because my identity is found in Jesus. That gives you, all of us, just a great boldness. And forgive me, Father, when I'm not bold and I'm ashamed. I don't want to bring it up because of what they're going to think of me. I don't know if you can relate to that. But one characteristic of being in the presence of Jesus is there's a boldness about him. And 5,000 people said, I want that. 5,000 people said, I, I, I hear that and I, I want that. It's a lot of people. The passage continues, verse 5. On the next day, so they had a night to sleep on it. What are we going to do with these guys? They're in a no-win situation. Because if they flog them and punish them and, and hurt them, they become some sort of folk hero and the movement grows. If they release them and let them to continue to do what they want to do, preach the gospel, the movement's going to grow. So what do you do if you're a Sadducee? Or the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is 70. There's 70 men. Many of them were... Sadducees. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes, they all gathered together in Jerusalem. Now they've added more to the opposition. Listen, you and, we're not measured by uh, who we're up against. We're not, we might look at who you're up against and think this is a no-win situation. When Jesus is on your side, you cannot lose. With Jesus on your side, you do what he asks you to do. You are in a win situation. You cannot lose. It doesn't matter how many rulers and scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and high priests, but they gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas. Annas had five sons. All were in leadership and had great power. And they're all there. Now, as I'm reviewing this text this week, I realize the first time these names are brought up in Scripture it's in a similar situation. There's a trial happening. The first time it was with Jesus. Where was Peter? It's over here, warming up by a fire. Couldn't even stand next to Jesus. He's too ashamed. He was called out by a middle school girl, called him out. But this guy was with Jesus. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. It's the same place. 
It's a different trial. Listen, if we're going to follow Jesus, which is part of our mission as a church, to make all in followers of Jesus, make disciples, guess what? We're going to experience some things that Jesus experienced. There's going to be days that's going to be really hard to be a follower of Jesus. It's going to be difficult. It might cost you something. Now, in our culture, it might be mockery. It might be scoffed at, laughed at. I don't think it's going to be physical persecution. Maybe, maybe that day's coming. Are you willing to count the cost? To stand next to Jesus? So, the beautiful part of this story, Peter is not by the campfire anymore. He's now standing. There's a fire, but the fire is inside of him. He's boldly proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. And he's saying, all I can do is tell you what I saw. I believe what I believe because I saw what I saw. I saw Jesus. He met Jesus. He was with Jesus. How do you know that if you've been with Jesus, there's a boldness about you? And his life was redeemed. He hadn't been following Jesus very long. Remember, this is the second time he's following Jesus. The first time he quit and gave up, went back home. And yet, God redeems his story, reclaims the story for good. And now this is the guy. This is the guy Jesus chooses to preach the resurrection. Are you kidding me? That's not probably who I would have chosen. That's not why, who you wouldn't have chosen. But God chooses us in our brokenness with a history and with a past. And now he stands He stands before the very same people who put Jesus to death. And so they gathered together, Anna, the high priest. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired. So you have this picture, Peter and John, just two guys. There's hundreds of people around them, and they're going to question them. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Now, did what? What are they asking? There's another man standing there with them. The crippled man. Because he went up jumping and running and praising God, and he's standing right there with him. Now, notice they didn't ask. They, they admit that he healed him. You couldn't deny the fact that he, his life was changed. Nobody can argue with your life change. And as you share your testimony, you say, This is who I was. Let me tell you about who I was. Let me tell you how I was a slave to the world. Let me tell you about all my hurts and all my addictions and all my habits. Let me tell you about that. But that's not who I am today. Because I met Jesus, I am a new person. Our identity is found in Jesus. Nobody can argue with that. That's your story. Nobody can say, well, that's not true. They couldn't argue that this man had been healed. So they didn't even try. Instead, they asked, Okay, we'll give, you that. we'll give you that. He's healed. We see that, obviously. He's running around jumping. Whose name did you do that in? This is a really important question. Because it's really easy to hijack kingdom work. It's really easy to attach a church name to kingdom work. It's really easy to attach a person's name to it. It's really easy to claim credit for ministry work. And so I ask all of us the question, whose name do we do ministry in. If you hold babies in our, in our preschool area, if you put windows in yesterday, thank you so much to the men who showed up to help us with that. If you serve with our students, if you're on our tech team or our worship team, this question is true for all of us. Whose name did you do that in? Is it in my, is it in my name? No. Now, Peter could have taken credit. He's like, hey, I've been put in charge of this new movement. I was with Jesus. He chose me to take the lead on this. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. By whose power, by what name did you do this? The head of the church, the head of the universal church, the head of the global church, the head of Boulder Mountain Church is Jesus. This is his church. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, what's he saying? All we did was show love. You're going you're gonna to accuse me of being kind to someone, of giving love to someone? Point number two, how do you know that you've been with Jesus? Number one was boldness and 
courage. Number two, you love people. When you're with Jesus and you've experienced the unconditional love in your life, you cannot help but give that away. You are not known as a follower of Jesus simply by knowing God's word. If that does not lead to loving people, then it doesn't matter that you know God's word. Know God's word. Love people. What's the greatest commandment Jesus has asked? To love God and love people. So what did Peter and John do when they saw a crippled man? They loved him and they healed him. So they're now they're being judged for being loving. May you and I be judged for being too loving. May that be said of us. What was said of the early church? They loved people. They were weird. They loved people who didn't deserve it. You know what? They even loved their enemies. Yeah. You know why? Because Jesus did. Jesus loved them to the point of death on a cross, asking for the people who were crucifying him that, God, you would forgive them. What's the second point that somebody might accuse you of being with Jesus? You love people. Can that be said of you? It'd be wonderful if people knew we were followers of Jesus by the way we loved people. Crazy, extravagantly loved. And so Peter's saying, really? You're questioning us because we did a good deed to a lame man? But by what this man has been healed... Let it be known to all of you, this is really important. This is one of my favorite parts of the passage. And to all the people of Israel, by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Peter did not take any credit for the healing. Because I didn't heal him. Jesus healed him. And oh, by the way, you crucified him. Now, Technically, spiritually speaking, we all crucified Jesus. We are all a part of that because of our sin. But he's saying directly, he's talking to the people who literally put him on trial and called him guilty. He's saying, you crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's giving a gospel message here. He's leveraging the position that he's been placed in, knowing that there are other people listening. And he talks about the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. Now, there's an old story. It's, it's not biblical. It's an old story passed down generation to generation, so take it for what it's worth. But when they were building the temple... The cornerstone that was brought up, when they built the temple, they did not cut the stones where the temple was. Why? Because that was so loud. There's prayers going on here. we got a service to run here. So can you go cut the stones somewhere else down in the valley? And so the story goes that the stones were, were cut down the valley and they were brought up. And that stone was brought up and it didn't fit. They didn't start with the cornerstone. They started with the other stones and the cornerstone didn't fit. And so they pushed it back down the valley. And at the end, when they were done building the temple, the story goes, there was a, they needed a capstone. A capstone that went above the temple. And that stone at the bottom, they, they said, wait, what, what's that stone doing? They brought that stone up and they put that up. In similar ways. Jesus is our cornerstone as a church. The foundation of the church is the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. Now, when we were in Mexico... Last weekend, we began to build that house. What's the first thing you got to do? You got to make sure that foundation is right. And you, you start, and once you start, that first block or that first piece of wood, it better be level or else everything else falls apart. If Jesus is not the foundation of this church, we'll fall apart. If we start taking credit for things that Jesus is doing, the church will fall apart. If we start doing ministry in our name rather than the name of Jesus, things will fall apart. If we start doing live nativity to make us look good, things will fall apart. If we do it in the name of Jesus, by which his name we are saved, there is no other name under heaven. Now, we might hear this today and think, oh, that's so exclusive. I don't know if I can buy that, to say that there's only one name, to say that there's only one way to heaven. Yes, there's only one way to heaven, but it's inclusive because the invitation is for every person on the planet. 
Jesus knows every person on the planet, and his heart is for them. He loves them. He cares about them. He gave his life for them. When we place our faith and trust in him, we find salvation. Salvation is, is in no one else. You, you can look. You can start with yourself. You can't save yourself. There's nothing else you can do. There's only one name. That name is Jesus. We sang it this morning. What a beautiful name. I tell you, when I have conversations with people, it's okay. People are neutral. I start talking about church and God. and like, okay, I hear you. Or whatever, if that makes you happy. You bring up the name of Jesus, the conversation changes. It changes everything. There's either an openness, a willingness. Now, we, we would say that's a person of peace. They're, they're open to it. Tell me more. I keep talking. Tell me more. I want to know about this Jesus. Or there's a complete opposition to it. More than that, there's a hatred. How dare you say there's only one way? Now, when, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the boldness, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. They were uneducated. They didn't have a Bible degree, a seminary degree. Jesus didn't either. They weren't rabbinical. They were ordinary guys, common men who had met Jesus. So what's the distinguishing factor? They met Jesus. And when you meet Jesus, everything changes. They recognize that they had been with Jesus. Zero in on that, highlight that, circle that, underline it, verse, end of verse 13. This is such a powerful phrase. They recognize that they've been with Jesus. Boulder Mountain, if we're going to be sent, as we go, as we meet with people, as we engage in the needs of the community, may they say they've been with Jesus. There's something different about this group of people. They've met Jesus. They love differently. They're more bold and courageous. There's a peace about them. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with another, saying, what do we do with these guys? That was my paraphrase. What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them as evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone. So it's like they're, they're getting off on a warning here. We, we, if you want to serve at Boulder Mountain, we have background checks, right? So, um, which is always fun. People get really nervous about that. We do that for the safety and security of our children and our, our students. There's background checks going on here in, among Peter and John. They're, they're being given a warning. Their background check is, hey, they, they've been with Jesus. They're guilty. They've been hanging out with Jesus. But they get off on a warning. And the warning is, this is the best answer solution they could come up with. Their warning is, don't do this anymore. Deal? And what does Peter say? Peter doesn't make a deal. He doesn't compromise. Compromise is the language of the devil a lot of times. Are there times to compromise in marriage and family and work? Yes. Spiritually speaking, compromise is often the language of the devil. So Peter does not say, okay, thanks for letting us off. We're going to head over to another town. What does Peter say? But Peter and John answered him, verse 19, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge saying, you, you guys decide who we listen to. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. When you see Jesus, and you recognize he's changed your life, you cannot shut up about it. You cannot stay silent. I know sometimes we stay silent for our security and our safety, and we think, well, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to lose my job. I want to keep the peace here at work. Be wise. Be shrewd, we're told in Scripture. But there are also times where we are bold. We proclaim the truth of Jesus and what he's done in our life. Because you never know. 5,000 people might come to faith. You don't know who's listening. You don't know who's watching. And when they had further threatened them, 
They let them go. They threatened, right? We fill in the blanks. How did they threaten? Did they threaten their families? Did they threaten that they would kill them? They had the right to kill them? See, the Sanhedrin wanted to keep the peace with the Roman government, and Peter and John were doing everything but that. The Roman government shows up. Hey, what's all this commotion? What's going on here? The Sanhedrin are like, we got this. We're in control. You know, it's okay. Because they wanted, they were having parties with the Roman government, keeping the peace. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For this man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. The rest of chapter 4 talks about all that happened as a result of this. The generosity, the worship services, this sharing of scripture. There's quote in Psalms. They quote Psalm 2. They quote Psalm 118, which is a messianic prophecy passage of scripture. But Peter and John, what, what are they doing? They're saying, the Old Testament points to this, this Messiah, Jesus. I, I know what I saw. I saw him. I was with him. My life was changed because of him. And that's why, in just a short amount of time, he can go from cowering at a campfire to proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus and thousands of people come to faith. What's the third sign that you've been with Jesus? It's the third one. First, boldness, comp- courage. Second is love. I'm going to propose to you, and I'm, I'm going to read forward a little bit here. This was the first sign of persecution. We're going to talk about persecution a little bit more in a couple weeks with the death of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. But the third sign is that there are scars. When we say we stand on the cornerstone, the foundation of Jesus, what are we saying? We're saying we stand on the shoulders of a man whose whose feet has nail piercings in them and whose hands have been pierced. That's who we stand on. And so do you think it might cost us something if our Lord and Savior, the chief cornerstone of the church, has some scars? Do you think we might receive some scars? Absolutely. If we're going to follow Jesus, and we're going to love people. Listen, Jesus was crucified. He was the most loving person who ever existed on this planet. Got him crucified. If we're going to follow him with such boldness and courage, do you think it might cost us something? Yes. What's God asking of you? It's worth it. If, there, if there's anyone in the room today who's not placed their faith and trust in the name above all names, in the beautiful name, in the name that by which we're all saved, the name of Jesus, you can do that today. You can settle that. You can leave here with the same confidence that Peter and John had standing before people. You can find your security and your identity in Jesus You can stop chasing other stuff. You can stop trying to save yourself. Say, today's the day I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Because I want what Peter and John had. I read this passage and I'm like, wow. Do I have that type of boldness? Do I have that type of courage? Can people look at me and say, oh, he's been with Jesus. Would you count the cost today? What's God asking you to give up? What's God asking you to do? Maybe something you've never done before. They've been with Jesus. And they've been forever changed. If you'd like to give your life to Jesus, let's pray right now. You can say in your own words, in your own heart, before Jesus, he'll hear you, he'll listen to you. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I cannot save myself. Forgive me for trying to save myself in all these other ways and through all these other means. And today I receive the unconditional love and forgiveness that you offer me. I recognize that you did, just not, you did not just die the death that I deserve to die, but you defeated death on my behalf. And you are my risen Lord and Savior. 
the name of Jesus, I place my faith and trust. And I'm banking everything on, on you, Jesus. If you prayed that prayer right now, there's a celebration going on in heaven. Every, anytime one person, one person repents and gives their life to Jesus, there's a party that's going on. And Father, for the rest of us, as we choose to follow you, forgive us for those moments where we cowered in the background. Give us strength for when real persecution might come one day. Help us to build those muscles of courage and boldness so that we can confidently stand and say, do your best to me. But as I follow Jesus, I will never lose. So Holy Spirit, as we sing, as we close this service, would you make it crystal clear what our next step is this morning? We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.